Hi everyone and welcome back. If you're new, my name is Dave Thomas, also known as 7 Shop 9 Today's video is going to be all about tiling the background. And to demonstrate some of this, I'm going to take you through a few of the old games that I used to play on my Mega Drive. This first one's called Granada, and you can see by the terrain, it uses um, a quite repetitive tile background. Um, but you can see how effective it is for, for reuse too. Here's another one of my old favourites called Raiden, and you can see there's also a very basic tiled background used here. And, and again, it's very effective for reuse as well, so you can draw simple assets and you can have them repeated throughout the levels, and it makes it very easy to um, construct levels for the level designers or graphics artists. This last one that I'm going to show is called Mercs. You can see again, there's a, there's a repeat to the backgrounds, but it still makes very effective game. The foliage is very repetitive, but there is certain things you can do when you're preparing the tile sets to decrease the amount of repetition in the tile sets. But often in these consoles, they were running with a very restricted size of uh, memory to store all of the assets. So let's jump right in. I've renamed the code from last one to Monogame 4 and let's scroll down and, uh, and start work. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to create a tile set using the normal f sharp record. It's going to have a certain amount of tiles wide, high, a certain tile width, a certain tile height. We're going to use a texture and an array of source rectangles. To make this easy to work with, we create a module called tile set and we create a function called create tile set, which takes how many tiles wide, high it is, and also the width and the texture. And we use this to compose an array of source rectangles that we're going to use. The idea behind this source rectangle array is that we loop over the y-axis from zero to the number of tiles high, then we loop over the x-axis between x and the number of tiles wide, then we yield a rectangle for each individual square within the entire tile set grid. We can now apply all of those to our record, including the source rectangles we created too. The next thing we need is actually a tile layer. This will be another record and it will describe which tile in the tile set is on each square in the actual tile layer. As usual, we'll create a module here called tile layer and we'll create a few helper functions that is going to help us to create our tile layers. This first one's called get tile ID, which takes an XY integer and the layer on which the tile is on and we use that to try and determine if we can actually get a tile from the tile layer itself. So we're using a match function to test whether the XY coordinates are less than zero, and in which case we return none to indicate there isn't actually a tile present. And we also have another part of the match function which detects when the X or Y axis is greater than the width of the tile layer, which would indicate a tile which isn't actually on the layer. So now that we've determined which XY indexes are not valid, we can go on to process ones which we think are. So first of all, we create an index by multiplying y by the layer width, then add the x onto that. We now we use another match expression to pipe the array of tiles into an array try find function. We pass in the index and then we match whether there is actually a tile in the array with that ID. And if there is, we return sum and we subtract one from the resulting tile ID because we are using zero to indicate that this is an empty cell. And you also see there is a guard clause in the match expression to make sure that the tile ID is greater than zero. The next helper function we're going to use is one called vector to cell. And this is basically to translate a position vector into a cell in our tile set grid. This is pretty easy to do because all we need to do is create a new point. We take the current position x coordinate and divide it by the width of the tile. We do the same thing for the y position. We divide that by the tile's height and we get a, a point which represents that particular cell. The final function we need and the most important is the draw one. We take in a sprite batch, a tile set, a camera, a layer, a tile layer, and a game. And the first thing we do is if the layer is not visible, then we exit early. The next part, we define a camera point, which is basically the top left location of the tile that we want to draw. So we create a vector two, we use the camera's X position and we subtract half of the viewport width. And for the Y axis, we take half of the viewport height. 
And this gives us a nice vector which indicates the top left position of the cell we need. And now we use the vector to cell function that we created earlier to convert that location into an actual cell. Now we create another let binding called viewpoint. We create a location based on the camera's X position and we add in half of the viewport width. And we also do the same for the Y axis and use vector to cell to convert the vector back into an actual cell. For this next part, we create a tuple let binding for the minimum X axis and the minimum Y axis. We use the max zero and the camera point X minus one and the maximum of zero and the camera Y point minus one. We subtract one to make sure there's always a full tile visible. For the maximum, again, we use a tuple binding, but instead we use the min function with the viewpoint x with an addition of one and the layer width minus one. The layer width minus one being the very last tile on the screen. And we do exactly the same thing for the y-axis too. So now all we need to do is loop through all of the minimum y-axis to the maximum y-axis, then loop through all the minimum x-axis through to the maximum x-axis. We use a match expression with our get field ID function we created earlier. And if there is no tile, we simply don't draw anything. If there is, we first check if the tile is minus one. And if that's true, then we exit early because this is actually a blank tile. The next thing we need to do is create a destination rectangle. To do this, we times the X by the tile sets tile width and the Y is the Y times by the tile sets tile height. This is the top left position of the rectangle. The actual dimensions of the rectangle is simply the tile set tile width and the tile set tile height. The very last thing we need to do is just do a sprite batch draw call. We pass in the texture, the destination rectangle, the source rectangle, which is the actual tile, and the color white. Now to use the tiles now game, we need to again create a, um, a tile set and a tile layer. We use the uncheck default of as usual, and we also create a terrain, which is the texture that we're going to use. So this is the texture that we're going to use. It's an open source texture that I'll include in the description. What we need to do is add this to the mono game pipeline. I've already copied the terrain to our content directory. So all we need to do is add existing item. Then we choose the item terrain and click open. And everything looks okay. So we can just build the, the content pipeline as usual and get back to our code. Now we can scroll down to initialize and initialize the items we declared earlier. So first up we've got the terrain. So we'll just load the, the texture that we just created with the pipeline tool. Next, we've got the tile set. So we use the create tile set function that we created in the module. So the tiles are 32 by 32 and there's 32 across and 32 down. Now we can create our tile layer. First, we need the tiles, but before we can do that, I wanted to show you what I use to create the tile layer. I'm using a program called Tiled, which is open source too. I'll add a link to this in the description as well. So here's the application. You can see I've drawn a little island from the set of tiles we added to the pipeline earlier on. It's pretty easy to select a terrain and, and just draw on the map rather than having to define this as a bigger array in a CSV file, etc. The actual format of tiled files is TMX. And you can see this is basically a list of all the tile IDs. And it also gives you the things like the width and the height. So what I'm going to do is just literally copy the, the tile IDs out into our tile array. You can see here, this is super unwieldy to, to deal with, but it'll suffice to uh, get us started. We can look at writing a proper load of this later on. So now we've got our rectangles, we can create our full tile layer because we know the tiles, the width, the height, and we'll set visible to true. Rather than setting our player's position to be zero, we'll set it to be exactly half of the size of the map. So this is the tile layer's width times by the tile set's tile width divided by two, and it's also the same for the height. So now we're gonna fix the minimum and maximum clamp. If you remember in the last video, the skeleton got stuck by an invisible barrier. The minimum clamp's really easy because it's just zero, vector two dot zero. The max clamp is fairly easy too because it's just the tile layer's width multiplied by the tile set's tile width minus the player's size in the x-axis. The y-axis is the same, it's just the height times by the tile height minus the player's size in the y-direction. We can now 
get rid of player size completely because you can see we're not using all we're just using the player.size.x and y we can now scroll down to draw and we can add our tile drawing function and for this we can just use the tile layer.draw that we created before passing in the sprite batch tile set camera the tile layer and this instance for game now we can hit debug and see what happens now you can see we've got our skeleton in the middle, we've got our map and we can walk around. If you look really carefully, you can see kind of some tear lines around some of the tiles. And this is to do with some of the settings that we're using on the sprite batch. If we look at the sprite batch begin, you can see one of the parameters is sample state. By default, this is using linear interpolation, which is blending between one pixel and another. So what we'll do for ours, we'll, we'll use a, a sampler state of point clamp to make sure that we're clamping to the nearest pixel. We'll also set the sprite sort mode to deferred as we draw not to tiles at once. And we'll also set the blend state to alpha blend to make sure that we're blending any alpha artifacts too. We can now hit debug and try again. And if we walk now, you can see there's no artifacts or screen ripping when we're moving about. So we'll leave it there for today's video and um, we'll do a bit more in the next one. I'd just like to take a moment to thank all my patrons. Your support is very much appreciated. Thanks. As usual, if you like this video, smash the like button and Feel free to subscribe, hit the bell notification if you want to receive notifications for the next video, and I will see you next time.